Wow, listen, let's just get into it. So during the Europa League draw, it was uh, the news broke that Al Ittihad had offered Liverpool up to £150 million for Mohamed Salah. £100 million rising to £150 million, which Liverpool have outright instantly rejected. And according to the likes of David Ornstein, uh, James Pearce, Paul Joyce, they now consider the matter closed. Um, in a word, good. Good Liverpool. Well done. Now, what we don't know is what's going on behind the scenes at Liverpool. And I suspect it largely goes like this. Um, is there anyone out there that we could get who is remotely as good as Mohamed Salah uh, for that money in the next 12 hours? Less than. Um, and the answer to that question is almost certainly no. Because anyone who is that good um, will be an essential tool for the team that they're already at and their question will therefore be is there anyone we can get with the money we've just received from selling our player um and, and so on and so forth basically it's a uh, robert ross it's a snake eating its own tail um so highly highly unlikely why are they doing this now um well why not i think what we've seen with the saudi pro league over the course of the summer obviously ronaldo is the the, the keystone he's the guy who, who kicks the whole thing off going back to last season i remember I'm, we we mocked, we laughed a little bit, didn't we? Um, I my theory on the transfer policy for the um, the, the Saudi Pro League teams, the ones with the Saudi Public Investment Fund money behind them, is that they got some of those key stars, the ones who are in the last few years of their career offered them ridiculous wages, of course, and sprinkled them out amongst their teams and a couple of others that aren't at those specific group of teams, but you know throughout the league. And then what happened is you then go and get a few more slightly lower tier players in, in there as well. But again, ones that are attainable. And I genuinely think that went better than they could possibly have hoped. So what we've actually seen in the last month is more punts on footballers that shouldn't be going to play at that level. Because all of a sudden now, and, and look, from Mo, Mo Salah's perspective, like the money, the money is going to be a huge draw. It's a huge draw for everyone who's taken it so far. Because even though Salah's on 350 grand a week, which is just mad. It's, it's, a, it's an insane amount of money for Liverpool. It's an insane amount of money for humans. Um, it's it's pretty good. It's, it's in the top sort of ish bracket in the Premier League. Um but the money can turn heads regardless. But what you're finding now all of a sudden is, well, actually, you know, you've got Benzema in that league and you've got Ronaldo and you've got Neymar. And whilst the overall level of competition is not there, because you have to remember as much as the, it feels like there's tons and tons of players that have moved there. You know, if every team in that league, and I think it's what an 18 man, uh, 18 team league, needs 22 to 23 players each one of those teams has got between one and sort of four recognized sort of players at most and uh, you're averaging across the league it's it's a little bit lower than that um but what i'm saying is there's a ton of players who aren't anywhere near the quality of those players that i've, I've just listed but there is all of a sudden like the due diligence has been done so it's going to make it easier to attract more players who've actually got a little bit more left time on their on the clock in their careers you know your Ruben Neves's and, and your Alan St Maximans are not going to be world stars but all of a sudden the prospect of going well I could go and play um at a, at a mid-tier European side or lower tier top end Premier League whatever or I could go and play with Karim Benzema, I could go and play with Sadio Mane, I could go and play with Neymar um, for a few years and earn much more money than I'm ever going to earn anywhere else. So I think we're starting to see that draw and power increase and Salah and Kevin De Bruyne are going to be key to the next stage of this because as much as they will both be players in their 30s heading towards the final stages, they will still have been counted as probably the best in the world in their positions at the time if they get them over the line in the next sort of 12 months. And what have you. And the thing from Salah, from a competitive perspective, so at the moment, obviously, he's going to do a season in, in the Europa League. Really good Europa League draw for Liverpool. I'm very excited, potentially, about a couple of really nice ways in there. Um, he's not going to be competing. He'll have an interesting decision to make next summer because if Liverpool get back into the Champions League, if Liverpool win some silverware, has he filled his boots as he won all he wants to win in the English game that's a possibility does he want to go and score some more goals in the Champions League maybe win another European Cup that's a possibility as well but if he wants to be known as like the best of the best well all of a sudden all of those recognised best of the best players 
are in that league. And look, Mbappe will have had another season by that time. Haaland will have had another season. There's going to be a new crop of young, early to mid twenties vying for that place of who are the best one, two, and three in the world. You know, gone are the days, of course, where it was so clear. We're now in that sort of mush middle period where the Messi Ronaldo days are over. But you know, people say, is Mbappe the best player? Well, has he really tested himself week in, week out? No, he hasn't. Haaland starting to show that, etc., etc. Salah could go younger than most of the stars that are in that league and go and be the best player in that. He can go and be the best of the best and he gets to challenge himself against Ronaldo and Benzema and Neymar and Mane um, and show that he is still the best player. So actually it might do his ego a bit of good. It's certainly going to do his bank balance a lot of good. Um, but I can see why that would be an interesting uh, you know, proposal. He's also obviously the biggest star in the Arab world as well and the religious side to tie into that, which you've seen with, with Benzema as well. He's just a huge global star. He'd be the biggest star in that league alongside probably Ronaldo, but also a guy who's still, still within the peak of his powers kind of age range as well. So I can understand why Salah would take it. I understand why he would be receptive to, to, to talking about it. I don't think he's going to do, you know, the three or four or five years it would probably take for him to be like really in the top echelons of goal scorers for Liverpool or appearances and all that kind of stuff. And there is a world where maybe this gets revisited next summer, which I'll come to in a second. But ultimately, right here, right now, I think Liverpool have done the right thing. A really, really smart thing. There's slight echoes with the Felipe Coutinho stuff. You have Jürgen Klopp quite clear, and he said this before, and I'm sure he'll say it again, doesn't want guys who don't want to pull their weight for the team. So if your head's been turned and you're not going to come and fight day in, day out in training, then he doesn't really want you there. But there are instances where Liverpool's management structure, maybe even the ownership group, step in. And we saw that with Coutinho. Coutinho down tools, didn't want to play, and Klopp was like, right, get rid. Just get him rid. I don't want him anywhere near my squad. And Liverpool's owners went, no. Because if we sell him now, it proves that we can be bullied. Uh, and, it, and it damages Liverpool's place in the food chain around that time. So instead, obviously, they hung on. They pushed him back into the team. They got a great little half a season out of him and then sold him for a ludicrous amount of money that allowed Liverpool to go and obviously pay for Virgil van Dijk and Alisson in the summer as well. And then the rebuild and Liverpool going up a gear was really off to the races. What this does open up for Liverpool, I think we've built the squad now. I think we've got a really solid squad. What I was always thinking is next summer, they'll be needing to add a, a gem or two. You want to get really, really good footballers from now on in. We can't know how big a defensive rebuild is going to be next summer. That might be a slight issue for this. But actually, instead of you buying a Mark Gray here, it might mean you get to go in for whoever the next Josco Guardiola is, which Liverpool clearly couldn't stretch to um, this summer because of so much other work that needed to be done. So all of a sudden, the interest in Sal is not going to go away. But if Liverpool can be smart about this, and I actually wouldn't even be against a similar thing that we saw with like Ian Rush or whatever, where maybe Salah gets disagreed. So you, it, it, it could be behind the scenes or whatever, and Liverpool can start to put the wheels in motion so they can start to get the, the buys done early. What Liverpool don't want is to get to the summer, accept a bid from Salah, and then go, what do we do with this money? No, they need to be very, very canny. This summer caught them on the hop. Stalin Fabinho and Henderson, those bids caught them by shock and we've been reeling ever since. Um, I think they finally caught up with it, clearly finally waiting. Graven Birch becoming available at last was a player they always wanted in the summer. So I think I think ultimately the midfield rebuild was smart. I did that in a video yesterday, do check that out. Um, but again, what Liverpool want to be able to do is really go into the transfer window in maybe even this January, do a similar thing to what we did with Luis Diaz, what we did with Gakpo. If you know Salah's going and you know that money's going to be coming in, go and get it spent, go and get the next Mohamed Salah, you know, if it's not Ben Doak, um, which it might be, but that'd be amazing if we didn't have to spend that money and we could spend it on just buying three world-class defenders instead. Who knows? It's, it's, a, it's a question for science fiction writers at the moment. But ultimately, smart move from Liverpool, because of the, 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 the overlap, in transfer windows closing with the Saudi Pro League, I expect at least another couple of weeks of these kind of probing bids and probing bids. This won't be a done matter. There'll still be private negotiations. Uh, you know, as it stands, the bid that's come in is not actually come in as an official launched bid. It was placed through a third party in like a, a friendly conversational kind of way. Um, so obviously there is a dialogue. Liverpool have, have made it categorical that they're not going to sell Salah because 
just why you're just weakening your proposition at this point. Liverpool want to get back into the Champions League. They want to compete for honours. And Salah's going to help make that happen. Will this be his last hurrah? I think yes. I think this will be Salah's last season at Liverpool. I think that offer is just going to be prove to be too tempting for both him and for Liverpool to really kick on with something else to kind of finalise Klopp 2.0 with some mega money. Um, and Liverpool do need to do that. They do need to kind of move players on. You know, you kind of can't have it both ways. We can't complain that we we let Mane go for too cheap and that we let Gini Wijnaldum and Firmino, etc. walk out on free transfers and then balk at the idea of taking £150 million for Salah when he's going to be 32. Um, that's smart business. As much as you could keep him for another five years and his fitness and all that kind of stuff might keep him being at the very top level. But you know what? Don't worry about it. Just go and get more good players and have them become legends for Liverpool anyway. Um, right, thoughts in the comments section underneath. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, and just as I said, I really enjoyed the um, Europa League draw, uh, particularly Chris Paytech's live efforts on Redmen TV YouTube channel. Go and check them out if you haven't done. Honestly, the, a whirlwind, a, a human dervish of a... <laughs> of draw activity is Chris Page yeah. Um, yeah I think it's a really good draw Rangers obviously won the best of ways but Liverpool's draw very very solid indeed not far to travel uh, and some new clubs along the way obviously we played Toulouse before um, but in terms of Lask and Union uh, good really really good really really good all reachable by, by, effectively by train as well which is great um, so boss uh, thoughts on anything in the comments below if you want 50% off a whole year of Redmen Plus so there's loads of Grab and Bird stuff there's Redmen Reacts to it there is uh, a Kevin Hatchard special on there uh, Dan is also speaking to one of his coaches and Ryan Babble today so make sure that you head over to RedmenPlus.com there's going to be draw reactions there's tons of podcast videos documentaries the one for me in the doc <gasps> amazing stuff get it half price use the code Ryan R-Y-A-N, as in Grab and Bitch, Ryan, on a Captain yearly subscription. Get a whole year of Redman Plus in podcasting videos, in your ears, face, eyes, mouth, nose, wherever else you want to shove it. Um, for 50% off for a whole year. It's a boss deal. Grab it while you can. Uh, RedmanPlus.com. Captain yearly. Code Ryan. Up the bid rejecting Reds. Cheers.